Okay guys, welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. It's that time of year when the Northern Hemisphere nights are getting shorter, so you have to make the most of the darkness whilst we still can. But those in the Southern Hemisphere are of course enjoying extended hours of darkness. But this month we've got lots of Milky Way core action. Mercury and Venus are dancing together in the night sky. I have an update regarding the Starlink satellites, which may be good news. We've now got three comets in the night sky, and there are also three planets in the morning skies as well. But before I go into more detail about all of those, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. There are thousands of inspiring classes covering a huge range of creative topics such as graphic design, photography, videography, freelance, and more. I'm sure many of you watching this video will appreciate Ian Norman's class on nightscapes, an incredible introduction to all things landscape astrophotography, or how about James Manning's Astronomy for Starscapes, which will help you make sense of the night sky and plan your astrophotographs with ease. I've been using Skillshare for just over here now and I've used it for all sorts of stuff. There are lots of good classes on freelancing and running a business, and also Adobe Premiere classes that help me edit these videos. Premium members get access to all of those courses and you can try as many as you like. And if you want to join along, just follow the link in the video description and you get two months completely free of Skillshare Premium. So let's start with a general look at the Northern Hemisphere night sky. Now as the sun sets, you'll see Venus is still in the western skies. And it's accompanied by a number of bright stars as well, so we've still got the the winter constellations hanging about, we've got Procyon, Pollux, Castor, Capella, lots of nice bright stars accompanying Venus. Now, Venus is getting closer to the sun in the night sky as the month goes by, which means it will spend less time in the evening skies as the month goes by. And something interesting happens towards the end of the month. I hope that tree's not going to get in the way. So if I just change the date by one day every click, so 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, and you'll see Mercury starting to make its way above the horizon. 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st, and then on the 22nd, they pass each other. So between the 21st and the 22nd is a conjunction of Mercury and Venus and I think two days later they're joined by a crescent moon which you can't see because of that tree um, but on the 24th there'll be a nice thin crescent moon Mercury and Venus in the evening skies so I'm just going to go back to the 22nd which is the date of new moon this month uh, let's see what happens when things get a little bit darker so in the north the constellation Ursa Major the plow is pretty high at this time of year it's pretty much directly overhead there of course Polaris the North Star there and so we have Cassiopeia sweeping across the northern horizon this month. Swinging down to the south, um, Leo is now a little bit more in the southwest, making its way down to the western horizon. But we have the two bright stars, Spica and Arcturus, in the southern skies. But the main action is, of course, in the eastern skies now. I'm just going to turn the brightness of the Milky Way up to 5. And you'll see that as the night goes on, the Cygnus region of the Milky Way rises high into the northeast. And then, of course, in the pre dawn hours, well, just after midnight, local midnight, going into the pre dawn hours, the Milky Way core rises into the southeast there and of course this is a good opportunity for a nice big Milky Way panorama because it's nice and low on the horizon 
As we get closer to sunrise, you'll see Jupiter and Saturn rising pretty similar to last month. However, Mars is now a lot further away from Jupiter and Saturn. So Jupiter gets a little bit brighter. It starts the month at minus 2.3 and ends the month at minus 2.6. Saturn gets a little bit brighter as well. It starts the month at 0.6 but goes down to 0.4. And Mars also gets brighter as well. It starts the month at 0 0.4 and ends the month at magnitude 0. So all the planets get in a little bit brighter this month. Now let's take a look at the southern hemisphere night sky and you'll see a similar story as the sun sets in the evening. Venus is still there in the western skies, but northwest. And of course, you can still see the Orion constellation pretty well from the southern hemisphere as well as Gemini, Sirius, the dog star, Procyon from Canis Minor. And of course there's a, a very similar story with Venus. As the month goes by, it gets lower to the horizon and then on the towards the end of the month, the 20th, 21st and the 22nd, it passes Mercury on its way down towards the sun. So, as darkness falls, we can see the small Magellanic Cloud is really low on the horizon. Large Magellanic Cloud starting to get higher in the night sky. In the south, of course, the Southern Cross and the Carina Nebula. And we'll see Scorpius and the Milky Way core rising into the eastern skies. As the night goes on, again, that's a really nice opportunity for a Milky Way panorama from the Southern Hemisphere. And in the Southern Hemisphere, the ecliptic, which is the path of the Sun and the planets, is a lot more steep against the horizon at this time of year. So you'll see Jupiter and Saturn and eventually Mars rising almost vertically from the horizon. So stacked on top of each other rather than parallel to the horizon like we're seeing from, uh, from the northern hemisphere. As for moon and planets, we've got the moon passing by the morning planets between the 12th and the 15th. This is what it looks like for us in the northern hemisphere. And then this is what it looks like from the southern hemisphere. So there's a nice opportunity there for maybe a 35mm or a 50mm focal length. To, uh, to get the moon and the planets there in a nice tight shot. Also on the 24th, as I briefly showed you earlier, the moon, a thin crescent moon, will be right next to Venus and Mercury. And then on the 26th, it may not be planets, but there'll be a nice opportunity to photograph the moon with Castor and Pollux, the heads of the twins, Gemini. Okay guys, so there is a notable meteor shower this month in the Etta Aquarius, which can reach rates of about 50 meteors per hour from a dark sky location, and it favours the southern hemisphere. But the peak this year is on the 5th, which is pretty closely timed to full moon, so really, really unfavourable conditions this year. Although about 25% of the meteors do leave persistent trains. So it may be worth still trying your luck if you have clear skies, but maybe aim your camera away from the moon. Now, this month there are three comets in the night sky. We've gone from a bit of a drought to having three comets at the same time. Last month I mentioned Comet Atlas to you guys, and I also mentioned that you should be a little bit wary about the hype about it getting naked eye visible and being a great comet and well that turned out to be pretty good advice because sadly Comet Atlas has fragmented into at least four pieces and it has been fading for the past couple of weeks so definitely not going to be naked eye visible and certainly not going to be the great comet that we were all hoping for but that's the thing with comets they're very tough to predict. They're very, very unpredictable. So you have to be a little bit cautious with getting too excited. Now you can still photograph Comet Atlas, uh, even though it's quite faint. So if you have a telescope or a good telephoto lens with a star tracker, 
Um, you can still photograph it as it's fading away now and you might even be able to get detail in the four separate pieces. So I'll put some links in the description below uh, how to find where it is on whatever night you plan to shoot it. Next up is Comet Swan, which was only discovered last month by amateur astronomer Michael Matiazzo from Australia. He was analyzing images from the Swan camera on board NASA's SOHO satellite and discovered the comet, hence the name Comet Swan. It's a comet that does favor the southern hemisphere at the moment, and if it continues to brighten at the rate that it is brightening, it may become naked eye visible uh, sometime between the 15th and the 23rd. If it does become naked eye visible, it will also be visible from the northern hemisphere. You can find it just after sunset in the northwest or just before sunrise in the northeast. But as demonstrated with Comet Atlas, uh, it's a bit risky to get excited, but just keep an eye on the news and see how it's getting brighter. And again, I'll put useful links in the video description below so you know where it is in the night sky. But fingers crossed, we have a naked eye visible comet this one. Lastly is Comet T2 Pan Stars, which was discovered back in 2017 and it has a really long orbit around our sun of just over half a million years. And this month it will make its closest approach to our planet and the sun. Uh, so you might not want to miss that. This one favors the Northern Hemisphere. It's currently within the constellation Camelopardalis and it slowly moves towards Ursa Major at the end of the month, but it's expected to reach its maximum brightness around about May the 15th. Now, it's not predicted to reach naked eye visibility, it's only predicted to reach about 8th magnitude. So, one for the binoculars, or your telescopes, or your telephoto lens on a star tracker, and it might even be visible in a wide angle shot as well. Again, links in the description for some more useful information about the whereabouts of that comet. Now some news about the Starlink satellite launches. There's been a lot of attention the past month, mainly because the two launches last month um, resulted in a lot of bright passes of the Starlink train over the UK, the USA and, and most of Europe as well. Part of the reason why they were so bright is something to do with the angle of the solar panels, which SpaceX have apparently adjusted. Um, but there's some slightly better news in that there are Another two launches this month, the eighth launch and the ninth launch. But in the ninth launch, Elon Musk has promised that all of the satellites will feature sunshades. So this is basically a fancy unfolding umbrella which blocks the satellite from reflecting the sun's light back towards Earth. So if that works, hopefully we won't see any more Starlink satellites in the sky, which will be Probably the best news of 2020. Lastly, before I get into the hashtag Wittens, just want to mention that we may see Noctilucent clouds toward the end of this month. We're coming into Noctilucent cloud season now. For those of us that are in mid-northern latitudes of 50 to 70 degrees north, I won't go into it in great detail in this video, but if you do want to learn more about Noctilucent clouds, check out my Wittens video from last June uh, and learn about them there. But I'll talk about it a bit more in detail next month but we may have some sightings towards the end of this month okay guys now on to the hashtag wittens for those of you that are new here every month i set a challenge for people to photograph and then tag your images on social media using the hashtag wittens and i pick my favorite three third and second place win a copy of my astro workflow lightroom presets and the first prize winner wins a photo view book of their choice now last month i asked you guys to photograph images with the theme of backyard astrophotography and self-isolation so images taken from your home from your windows or from your back gardens or front gardens and there were so many entries this month there's been over 10,000 posts now on the hashtag Wittens which is insane and there were so many good entries that I couldn't pick three so I've picked my top five so in fifth place was Cumbrian Stargazer with a lovely image of the Venus and Pleiades conjunction we had last month. And of course, a lovely foreground of a chimney, which is becoming all too common now with everyone being sort of stuck at home. There's a lot of uh, chimneys and satellite dishes in the foreground, but it's just got that theme now of backyard astrophotography, and I love this image. Next up was S. McNally 20, who's got a lovely image in Twilight of the Moon, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. So a nice planet-filled sky, a 
planets and the moons literally lining up and I love this sort of blue hour shot with the nice warm yellow lights as well. In third place was this image, oh, <laughs> okay, it's S. McNally 20 again, I didn't realise, uh, but this image of Sirius and out of focus star trails of Serious. This is one of the things that I put into my 10 ideas for backyard astrophotography video last month and I was really hoping people would take those ideas and make them their own. Uh, so I saw a lot of people copy Steve Brown's uh, sort of pop art style of Sirius um, but Steve's instead of moving the camera uh, he's let Sirius move through the frame and take multiple shots and get a sort of out of focus star trail and I love it the colours are awesome and bonus points for taking the idea and making it your own. In second place was Jay Chen with this gorgeously thin crescent moon setting over the cityscape and you can see how the moon goes from yellow to orange and then red as it disappears and starts getting through more of Earth's atmosphere. I really, really love this image, nice and sharp. A little bit of Earth shine on the top moon and just that gorgeous thin slither of a crescent. Very, very nice. And then in first place was this absolutely gorgeous image by Simon Newman, who's done star trails in the reflection of his pond in his back garden. And I love this image. This is so good. When you first look at it, your brain is kind of confused and you're asking yourself, what's going on here? Uh, and then when you read the caption or you work it out, it's just still just such a beautiful image. It's got this really abstract feel to it. Um, I don't know, I've just been looking at it for quite a while now and the colours are amazing, a little bit of pink in the sky, sort of complementing the, the pink flowers in the foreground there. And this was an easy winner for me this month, even though there were so many entries this month. Um, this image just really, really stood out, both for the creativity, the execution, and the final result is just stunning. So, Simon, you'll be getting a photo view book of your choice this month. Um, a lot of us are still, of course, stuck in, in lockdown and, and quarantine, so we'll try and keep it fair. Let's go with the moon. I'm probably going to be doing my HDR moon tutorial this month as well. Um, so let's go with the moon. Wide angle, telephoto, conjunction, silhouette. Get creative, guys. And before I go, a quick shout out to all of my supporters on Patreon. Thank you so much for being the driving force behind this channel and allowing me to continue creating these videos. And that's it, guys. If you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.